Welcome everybody to the Caribbean time slot session of uh, um, data repositories. Uh, no, sorry, <laughs> ethics of, of data sharing. So just let me make sure that I got the session title correct. Um, I am Florian Knoll. I'm from the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg in Germany. And I'm co-moderating this session with uh, my colleague, uh, Matt Muckley, who is from Facebook AI Research. We both have a joint history at NYU. Um, and uh, so we have an exciting session ahead of us and a tutorial at the end of it. And I just want to um, hand it over to our first speaker today, uh, Greg Krohn from Stanford University, who's going to talk to us about uh, data repositories, where to look, how to share. Greg, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to your talk. Well, thanks, Florian. So let me try to share screen here. Let me set up my little laser here. Okay, I'll go full screen. You can see everything, you can see the little laser. All right. Okay, so um, this is gonna be a, actually a pretty simple talk. So this is uh, just exa some example data repositories. Uh, here's my little uh, disclosure slide, nothing to disclose. So um, minimize you guys here. So. Uh, the outline is very, very simple. All I'm going to do is show you a big publicly available Excel sheet with some example repositories. So a long while ago, um, Stephen Sorbron invited me to join um, OCIPI. So this is the Open Science Initiative for Perfusion Imaging. Um, perfusion Imaging and MRI is um, something where you acquire a lot of data because you're taking movies of, of uh, of things, movies of gadolinium going through tissues uh, and various things like that. So it's a lot of data. And um, there's a lot of ways of analyzing it. There's a lot of code involved. So um, uh, Stephen and uh, Laura Bell and other people established OCIPI and it, the mission is to create an open access source uh, resource for perfusion imaging researchers in order to eliminate the practice of duplicate development, improve the reproducibility, reproducibility of perfusion imaging research, and speed up uh, the translation into tools for discovery, uh, open science drug development, and so forth. So because um, in perfusion imaging, there's just so many different people doing many, many different things. And the idea is to um, make it so people don't reinvent the wheel. Um, and part of that is part of the idea of that was uh, to share, not just share code, but also share data. So the task force that I was invited to join. Oh, okay, so oh, first of all, the, the OCB website is here. It's just simply OCB.org. If you go to that website, uh, you can go to the AIMS section here. And then if you go to the drop-down menu um, and you go to task force 3.2. So this is the one that I was invited to join. This is clinical and preclinical data. So an, an attempt to sort of share, share data sets. And if you go there, um, you go to a new page, you scroll down the page and go down to task force uh, members links. You go to the third item, which is inventory of public imaging repositories, relevant or potentially relevant to perfusion imaging. Comments and edits are welcome. So this is um, a publicly available Excel sheet. Anybody can go in there, you can change it, you can make comments, you can do whatever you want. You just click on this little link there and it brings you to the Excel sheet. So this was something that I worked on in kind of the early days of the task force. Um, I had absolutely no idea where any of these repositories were located. So I just started Googling things and looking around. Um, and I gradually built up this, this Excel sheet. So um, it's just a two-dimensional Excel sheet. So there's an, a, you know, an x-axis and a y-axis. Along the y-axis is repository characteristics. And along the x-axis is um, all the different repositories that I could find. And the different repositories are definitely not exhaustive. It was there I could find in the limited time I had, but definitely not exhaustive. And I'm just going to take you guys through this um, Excel sheet and tell you about the different uh, characteristics on the y-axis 
and then the different repositories along the X axis. So let's start off um, just with the, the Y axis. So we're gonna use the example of the Cancer Imaging Archive. So that's a, a, a data repository which exists. And really for gadolinium enhanced uh, MRI imaging, it's sort of the um, one of the best, but definitely one of the best for MRI perfusion. Um, sort of the best put together. It actually seems like they really thought about this carefully. Um, one thing that's very important to know that Andre Fedorov told me um, yesterday about this is to remind everyone that actually this, this repository is for cancer only. So it's not gonna address all needs. So it's not gonna be, you know, fMRI and things like that. It's just for essentially for gadolinium enhanced imaging of cancer. And I think this is an important note for all these repositories. Most of them, well, a lot of them are not sort of general, um, general repositories for everything. A lot of these are uh, specific. So they're specific for a specific field, uh, maybe a specific country or a specific uh, purpose. Uh, so you have to kind of keep that in mind. There are some repositories that are really, really broad for everything, but not all of them. This is one example of those. So I'm just gonna go through um, the characteristics here. And we're gonna start off with um, the very first one, which is the, the website homepage. So that's pretty self-explanatory. It's, it's just a website uh, that you go to to get to the repository. Next up is I tried to give um, a brief description of the repository. So for example, this one is uh, cancer imaging only, currently uh, six to 700 subjects with DCE or perfusion. Uh, next up is the purpose of the repository. This one, we said it was uh, imaging. And then access constraints. So kind of, um, you know, how difficult is it to get on there? So um, in this case, collection level uh, includes public and restricted access collections. Then um, there's a, a row called current downloadable stock of perfusion images. And for this one, estimated around six to 700 DCE or perfusion studies. Now, often for, for this row here, um, it was very difficult to try to figure this out because you, know, you can go to the search function and do a broad search, but that doesn't necessarily you know, reveal everything that there is on the site. So this is a bit of, a, bit of an estimate here. Um, next up, as we tried to put a, a link to an example perfusion data set that would be um, on this repository. So this is a, a link to an example set on the DCIA. And next up is uh, constraints on the data size for upload. And for this one, none are stated. Uh, I'm gonna stop here and go on a little detour. because this is, this is one of the most important parts of any repository. So it's a, it's a really big deal. How much, you know, how much data can you upload? Like what's the size limits? And basically, you know, roughly speaking, anytime you're gonna load more than a few gigabyte, um, you're gonna run into a bit of a problem. So uh, typically you're gonna have to spend money. So either, you're gonna to have to spend money or your institution will have to spend money or something, you know, some kind of deal has to be made. Um, and this is kind of one of the big limitations of, of these repositories. Um, and of course, if you're doing dynamic contrast enhanced MRI or dynamic susceptibility MRI, or if you're doing uh, fMRI um, to a certain extent, arterial spin labeling, and definitely if you have histology images, histology images, histology images take up huge, huge, huge amounts of space. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. And a few comments about this is it's important to know just how permanent a repository is. And ideally you want something that's gonna last pretty much forever. And um, so I, I, ideally what you really want is a repository that since that's, kind of hosted within some kind of long-term institution. An institution that, you know, sees itself existing for a very, very, very long time. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, I I'm biased because I just moved to Stanford, but, you know, Stanford does have its own sort of internal um, archiving system. So something like that would probably be, be ideal because you, you figure Stanford University probably isn't going to go belly up anytime soon. <laughs> it's probably going to be around for a really long time. So something like that would be ideal. Um, Got to make sure it's well backed up. Um, 
had a colleague just the other day who lost a ton of data because some, something went wrong <laughs> in the repository and they lost a bunch of stuff. Um, it has to be immune to personnel changes. So if somebody moves away or whatever, um, you know, that shouldn't really matter. So I guess these are kind of obvious things, but I, I wanted to point them out. Okay. So next on to the next uh, row, um, ease of download. So, you know, how difficult is it to download the data? So for this one, uh, it's public and no registration is required. So that's really nice. Um, ease of preview, I guess, you know, in terms of images, uh, this one actually has uh, an integrated image viewer. Um, next row is ease of upload. So, um, you know, how easy is it to upload data? And for this one, there is an application process involved. So maybe not quite so easy. Um, ease of search. Uh, this one has imaging specific search uh, capabilities. And so the next row is um, <clears throat> DOI generation. Um, so the question is, does this repository generate um, a digital object for your data? You put it on there. And that's, that's um, it's not something I know a ton about, but I think it's, it's important when it comes to um, sort of the permanence of things on, on the internet. And I'll go on another little detour about this because I was actually watching a talk the other day by some guys at Stanford and they were talking about different types of sort of DOI things. So again, a DOI is a digital object identifier and that is a, a long lasting reference to the object. So it's something that, um, you can't just disappear into the ether, right? It's something that's more solid. And there are different types of these objects. So actually um, there's, a, there's ORCID, which I'm sure most of you have heard of. This is a persistent identifier for researchers. So this is for actual people. Uh, the DOI um, is for articles, data sets, and other digital materials. So it's sort of for information. There's also one called an RRID. And this is a persistent identifier for resources, um, cell lines, equipment facilities, and so on. So this is a, a sort of like a DOI for um, facility for physical facilities. And then there's actually one um, called an ROR, which is a persistent identifier for organizations. So probably we're going to see more about all this stuff in the future. Um, so I thought I'd go off on a little tangent about that. Um, but in our in our case, we we're just talking about the DOI. Uh, generation. So this is a persistent identifier for your data. Okay. Uh, next up, we have a row. We sort of looked to, to see if, um, if this repository is accepted by certain academic journals. So for example, this guy is accepted by uh, Nature, Scientific Data, and Medical Physics. And that's important because, um, you know, if you're trying to publish uh, in a journal and they they insist that you put your data um, in a public repository you want to make sure that the one you're using is one that they accept but i think usually i think when um often when they they sort of insist on that they have their own repository or they they suggest one so this is probably not a big issue um next up is um uh the fairsharing.org entry and I don't actually know tons about fairsharing.org, but from what I looked it up, it's, it's a pretty ambitious website. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to establish standards for repositories. So for example, um, the minimum metadata required, it's kind of like, it sounds like they're sort of, you know how people did DICOM for medical images? It kind of sounds like that's what these guys are trying to do for data repositories. And I don't know ton, a ton about it, but I just wanted to mention it. And while I'm there, there's also um, another uh, uh, organization or group of people called, uh, and they're, they, it's the Brain Imaging Data Structure, so BIDS. And so this group of people is trying very hard to standardize brain imaging data. And um, if there's time in the discussion afterwards, I would actually, I don't know much about this. I would actually like to know what people think of this. Um, is this a, a kind of an up and coming, um, standard or is it kind of off on the fringe or does anybody know I'd, I'd kind of I actually kind of like to know because I feel like this stuff is um, going to be more and more important over time and I know and in, in, in the lab I work in we have a ton of archived data and it's a complete mess there's just different formats and nobody organized it uh, we're, we're going to uh, eventually hire a data manager to go and organize it and kind of want to know like you know should they put it into this you know sort of um, organizational format or what should we do like how how big is this 
anyway. Um, okay, so the, the next row um, in this is um, time to publication. Um, so how long does it take once you upload it? Uh, how long does it take to, um, uh, to actually be published? Um, next row is de-identification. Um, so uh, the Cancer Imaging Archive actually performs de-identification and um, Andre actually told me that uh, it works with the submitter to de-identify the data set. And this is a very unique feature that is not available anywhere else. And I, I suppose de-identification is obviously way more important if you have um, human images, uh, defacing and you know, uh, anonymizing that sort of thing. Maybe not so important um, for uh, animal studies, but that's another thing that people have to think about. Um, the data format. So um, this one uses uh, DICOM uh, and then various other formats. But DICOM seems to be a big one. Um, the registration uh, link to, re to register for this um, uh, for this repository, uh, the login link, uh, a link where you can search, and the link where you can upload. Okay, so that's um, I think I got a few minutes left here. So that's the the y the uh, the y axis on uh, this uh, Excel sheet. So now let's talk about the x axis. So this is just the different repositories. And once again, it's not exhaustive. It's just all the ones that I can find. A few other people found a few more, and then I saw a couple more more recently. And um, starting off, of course, with the Cancer Imaging Archive, which we just talked about extensively. <clears throat> this is a really good one for cancer, especially for gadolinium-enhanced uh, imaging. Uh, there's one called Open Neuro. Um, this one is a little bit MRI, but a lot of other types of imaging uh, and other types of data, EEG, IEG data. There's XSNAT Central, which honestly I don't know a whole lot about, but it seems to be a fairly, um, fairly large one. There's NITRC. Uh, this is an image repository offering a cloud-based federated neuroimaging data storage system uh, for data sharing. And this one, um, it says it's available for thousands of subjects and imaging sessions, and it's based on XSNAT. So I guess these two are linked. Next up is the Open Science Framework. And it's an open source software project that facilitates open collaboration research science. Uh, moving along, we have Zenodo. Zenodo is my favorite because it's so simple. <laughs> and this is um, data storage and sharing on CERN's computer. So that's the big uh, particle accelerator in uh, Switzerland slash France. There's lots of space, super easy access. This is incredibly easy to, um, to upload and download things onto, and it generates DOIs and everything. Um, just kind of to blow your mind, CERN, <laughs> the CERN system has one exabyte of storage. That's one million terabytes. And most of that is for their particle accelerator experiments, but they've allocated a little bit for um, other people, I think in part to justify their existence. So they have lots and lots of data. Um, they, um, if, you, if you have a, a data set up to 50 gigabyte, it's like, you know, only takes a few minutes to, to upload it on here. There's a DOI created and everything. So this is really great. Um, I like this one. Um, there's a FigShare. Uh, this is an open source repository that facilitates collaboration and reproducible research. Uh, we got Dryad. This is a digital repository. It's a curated resource that makes research data discoverable, freely reusable, and citable. It provides general uh, purpose home for wide diversity data types. Then there's something called BMI XNAT, which is, must be related to the other XNAT. And then, so the ones that are in yellow are kind of highlight are what we felt were maybe a little less um, practical for perfusion imaging um, or not practical at all, but something, the stuff that we thought we should put into the, to the Excel sheet just to make people aware of it. So there's the Human Connectome Project. Uh, this is a large repository of structural fMRI and um, arterial spin labeling data of normal brain. Next up, we got the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, or ADNI, so for Alzheimer's uh, type data. You have SICAS. It says it offers a unique combination of competence in acquiring and storing medical images, processing and visualizing data for research and applications in medicine. There's Cardiac Atlas Project, so all kinds of cardiac data. And then there's Dataverse, which is a fairly big one. 
uh, repository for any research data in any field. Uh, there's Mendeley data. I have a note here. It's a cloud-based, oh, that's a misspelling, uh, cloud-based repository, uh, 10 gigabytes per data set. And then the last one that I found actually fairly recently is the Science Data Bank. Uh, I believe this one's based in China. Um, it was mostly in Chinese. The English translations weren't very good, but um, it says it provides free online services for scientific research individuals in the aspect of data storage and data publish. So those are all the repositories we could find. I'm sure there's others. But those are the ones that we could find. Um, so to summarize, um, the repositories which we found are simply located in this, ex ex in this Excel sheet. You're more than welcome to go in there and look at it, add to it, make some comments, change things, whatever you want to do. Um, you don't want to write the link down. Um, it's in the OCP Task Force 3.2 um, inventory of public imaging repositories. I feel like it's still kind of early days in terms of repositories um, and still lots to learn. And I haven't uh, myself, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, I haven't uploaded um, any data sets to repositories yet. Um, part of it is uh, some, like a lot of my data was, you know, human patient data. So how do you deal with the, the legal issues of all that? And even with mouse data, um, there are, you know, intellectual property issues and things like that. So things are, there's a lot of tricky issues to navigate. Um, and I still think we're, I still feel like we're still figuring this out. Um, anyway, that's all I have. And I hope this gives you some flavor for available repositories. Thank you. Thank you very much for this great overview and analysis of what is out there in terms of resources. Um, I think we can take maybe one or two questions. Somebody has a question that they wanna type in the chat. Otherwise I can maybe start out with one um, to get us started. Uh, you mentioned one of the repositories that they are actually working together with the uploaders for the de-identification. That is an interesting model. I, I mean, it's of course a very, very valuable service for somebody who is unsure how to approach this. I wonder how they deal with liability. So do they then accept liability from the, from the hosting uh, repository point of view if something goes wrong or is the liability still on the uploaders uh, um, yeah. responsibility. I, you have an idea? Yeah, I, that's a really, really good question. I honestly don't know. It's a really good question though. Um, but yeah, I don't honestly don't know. Because I remember that that was always something that our, our legal team at NYU was <laughs> very, very cautious with. with, with our yeah, business. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's one uh, question whether you can share the link to the uh, spreadsheet for the database. Yeah. Uh, Let me do that here. No problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, here, I'll send it to everyone else. Cool. Um, so there's one question from the chat, um, whether it would make sense to add in the curation um, a listing information, whether it's preclinical or only clinical data. Mm. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll, uh, I'm gonna make a note of that. I can try to figure that out. That's a good, that's a good point. Okay, then yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, let's all uh, thank uh, Greg and um, let's move on <laughs> to our next, uh, not, not quite the same effect as in an in-person uh, conference, of course. But.